Um, thanks for joining me today. I would stand, there's not that many people here, so I feel a little weird like towering over you in such a small space. Um, today I'm presenting on one of the research projects I've done since I arrived here at MSU. And this is involving uh, research with parents and teaching them some interactive strategies to support their children's communication. Um, in this particular project, I worked only with parents who have children who have an autism spectrum diagnosis. Um, and um, those children also had what we'd call complex communication needs. So I'll detail all of that, kind of explain how that group might be different from some other groups of children just generally with autism. Um, so first, okay, first I'll um, just detail a little bit about autism and communication. I know everyone here knows about autism, but just briefly kind of focused on that, that communication aspect of autism. I'll talk about augmentative and alternative communication, often referred to as AAC, and how it might relate to children with autism who are having communication challenges. And then I'll talk about, the, about parent training in general, and then I'll talk about communication partner training. Um, then I'll go into the study that I actually did for this. So that's just some of the background I'll provide. So we know that um, children with autism show deficits in social communication and social interaction skills. That's one of the primary ways that it's diagnosed is those social and communication deficits. Um, but we know that actually approximately a third of children with autism also have verbal, limited verbal skills because of that challenge that they're facing. And so this is the group that I'm most interested in when I'm working with kids with autism because I want to help support their communication because we know that communication is a way to access and access the world around them. But it's also a way for them to show that they have competence because we know that if people presume that they don't, that they aren't competent, that that limits what they're able to do um, in academic settings and such. So this group who have you know, these, these communication challenges, limited verbal skills, are often referred to in the literature as having complex communication needs, um, sometimes listed as CCN. This goes hand in hand with kids who use augmentative and alternative communication but basically it just means they don't have sufficient speech to meet their everyday needs. So they're not able to communicate their wants and needs effectively, and so they use other means to try to get their point across. So when we're talking about this group, many of them are using augmentative and alternative forms of communication. Um, this includes things like pictures or speech generating devices. Some children might use sign language or gestures. Um, most of the children that I've worked with to this point don't have a great formal system. They may have a system that they use at school, but at home, mom and dad have sort of been using less formal systems for quite some time, and so they sort of rely on those. So most of the kids that you'll see in this particular project um, don't even have access to like a higher tech system, even though they may need that for their communication challenges. At this point, they're still relying kind of on gestures and other less formal means of communication. Um, and I'll kind of detail that a little bit more, I'm realizing that this chair is kind of in the way. Um, so when we're talking about providing AAC interventions um, for kids with autism or any kind of communication challenge, it's a two-pronged approach. So a lot of times people will focus on providing intervention directly to the child, and that's really great and that's important, but if we only provide intervention to the child, that's usually maybe about an hour a week with a speech-language pathologist, and we're missing all that other time that the child could be benefiting. So the second approach is what I focus on, and that's training to their communication partner. So this could include people like family members or other care providers, um, educators, peers, et cetera. Um, so why do we even want to teach communication partners? I mean, it would seem that maybe parents already know how to support their children's communication, but unfortunately the literature has shown us for many decades that parents often, and other communication partners, often limit communication opportunities um, inadvertently by anticipating the needs of their child. So that seems like a good thing at first. If the child might need something, the parent figures it out before the child might have some form of communication to let them know. So, um, But that also doesn't give them the opportunity to communicate about something that might be really powerful. So for example, a parent might be like, oh, it's about the time they normally get hungry for lunch. I'll just go ahead and prepare them something I know they love to eat. They provide it for them. The child has no opportunity to say I'm hungry, to talk about what they might want to eat, so that those opportunities are kind of limited. Um, communication partners often also dominate communication interactions. I know I'm guilty of this, I'm a little bit of a talker. And so, and so it's really hard to teach people to just kind of step back, especially if there's a child who really doesn't communicate very much because you have this 
need to fill that space and that, that void of, you know, language that's not happening in the situation. So it's, that's one that's a little bit difficult sometimes for parents and other communication partners to sort of um, stop. Um, sometimes they just limit communication opportunities. If every time you ask a question to someone, they generally don't answer, you might just stop asking questions. And so that's something that we work with um, communication partners as well. Uh, sometimes they fail to recognize communication attempts. Maybe the child tries to speak, but the parent didn't understand what they were saying or didn't recognize they were saying something, or maybe they reach for something and they don't recognize that they may be requesting that item. So teaching them to understand those subtle behaviors is important. And a lot of communication partners ask primarily closed questions. Um, this is because they think they're probably easier to answer and maybe the child will be more successful, but that doesn't lead for a lot of uh, more lengthy communication interactions. So communication partner training um, really focuses on impacting the communication partner's behavior, but also what, does, what impact does that have on the child's communication or other individual who has communication challenges. Um, so, like I said before, the communication partners could be any number of people. And there's actually in 2005 a communication partner instruction um, model that was suggested um, from Kent Walsh and McNaughton where they used a strategy instruction method, which is a method that's typically used with kids who have learning disabilities and other more mild disabilities to help them remember more um, lengthy steps to a process that they need to do. And so they applied that to teaching communication partners as a way. Hi, thanks for joining us. I just noticed we have two friends. Um, so, so in this particular case, they, they took that model and applied it to this particular situation. And it includes, involve, it, it involves to providing a description of the strategy steps that you're using. So you create some kind of strategy of different things you want the communication partner to do. Provide a description of that first, then you model, um, that particular strategy. So in my situations, I use video to show them this is what it looks like in the practice. Um, then they do verbal rehearsal of the different steps of the strategy. So in my case, I provide a mnemonic and I ask them to memorize that mnemonic and then tell me what the different steps of the mnemonic are so that I know that they've internalized and, re and memorized or remembered those different steps. They don't have to think about them when they're in the moment. Um, and then they don't have to rely on a piece of paper or something and have their attention diverted. And then also, um, we provide guided and independent practice as part of this model. So giving them a chance to try this out uh, with some support and then removing those supports. So just really good practice in general for teaching. All right, so uh, parent training research um, has covered a lot of areas. So when we're talking about um, communication training specifically for parents of children with autism, um, we know that parent training can help improve parent communication supports and also then can in turn improve the child's communication. So that's promising. But the current, current research is really primarily on developing uh, verbal language skills for kids with autism. And that's great <coughs> if those children will actually develop um, a large repertoire of verbals, uh, verbal communication. But some of these kids may not. And we know that there's a subsection of kids with autism that may never develop a functional verbal speech verbal skills. Um, so there's really very limited research on interventions that are focused specifically for populations who might require augmentative and alternative communication, and there's very limited research um, in online approaches as well. Um, so some of that is emerging, and that's kind of where I'm trying to fill the gap here. So in this particular project, I asked the following research questions. The first one is the primary research question that was focused on. Um, basically, what is the effect of this online program in helping parents uh, provide more opportunities for communication for their child? And then I had two secondary um, dependent variables that I was also measuring, looking at the frequency of the child communication turns and the impact that the online training would have for that, as well as the frequency of parent responses, um, which we know that the frequency of child communication turns is very closely related to the parent responses, all of which are important. But I made the decisions of when people would receive training, when, if we knew how well they were doing based on that primary dependent variable rather than the secondary, or secondary variables. All right, so for this project, I used a single subject multiple baseline probe design um, with three different dyads. Uh, we had um, a staggered training approach as is required in this particular um, research method. 
and the parents completed the online training and had five play practice sessions during that training session so we'll see that and of course had baseline before that and we were looking for about a 35 percent increase over the baseline mean as our means of saying yes we think this intervention has been you know effective we can move the next person into training <laughs> All right, so we had three different participants for this project. I think one of the most exciting things for me with this particular group was we had a very diverse sample. Um, previously, when I was working at Penn State, that kind of stuff just didn't happen. There wasn't as much diversity. So it's pretty exciting to see that we had parents from a lot of different backgrounds um, and children at, at varied levels of communication abilities with autism as well. So we have um, Dyad A, Anna and Adam. Anna was 36 years old. She had a bachelor's degree in marine biology and she currently stayed at home with her son. The time of the study, her husband was actually living out of state, so she was kind of single parenting things uh, with her children. She also had two other children that were not in the study. But Adam was four and a half at the beginning of the study and he primarily communicated non-verbally. We'll, I'll show a video of him later. You can kind of see where his communication level is at. Um, he used a lot of gestures and pointing or kind of guiding the partner to try to get their attention. At school, he used picture symbols, but they really did not utilize them at home because it was mostly for requesting. And if he wanted to request something, he would just go get it and, or lead his, you know, his partner to whatever he was trying to request. So they didn't find it as functional as, as they had hoped. Um, and that's actually pretty common for a lot of parents. They have, you know, maybe a system at school that works really well and makes sense for the school environment, but at home, something you know, that doesn't take as much effort is working just fine. And so they don't necessarily use the, the AAC as much or the more formal means of AAC. Diet B was Bridget, um, who's 40 years old. She had a uh, Bachelor of Science in Organizational Administration and was working as a program analyst. She had three other children who were living in the home at the time and she had two other children as well from a previous um, relationship who were not living in her home. Um, her son, Ben, was four years and two months at the beginning of the study. He often communicated verbally, but it was pretty difficult to understand his communication. And um, he used a lot of nonverbal communication to kind of support that language that he had verbally. So things like gestures and pointing. Sometimes he also used sign language, which he had used when he was younger, but still kind of maintained um, in some situations. He had a lot of behavior challenges if he wasn't being understood. And so that was kind of um, something that was different in this study from some of the other groups that I've worked with. Um, so for Diet C, we had Catherine, she was 35 years old, she had an associate's degree and was working as a surgical technician at the time. She was a single mom um, and had two other children. Um, and her son Charlie, she actually had an older son also with autism, so she had two children with autism. Um, and this particular, the, her youngest son was the one in the study. Um, he was five and a half years old. He did communicate verbally, but often, again, was a bit unintelligible. His mom had to ask for him to repeat things frequently. Um, and he um, also used nonverbal communication to try to get his point across, but really preferred that verbal communication even if he wasn't being understood. Um, he did have behavior challenges as well. And I forgot to mention, but I'll also show you some video of Dyad B. Um, Dyad B and C were much more similar in the way that they communicated and their challenges, whereas Dyad A, his communication level was definitely much lower than the other two. And you'll see that in graphs in a minute. All right, so in, uh, we had three different uh, phases of this study. Baseline, we had five sessions for each participant um, that were staggered over depending on when they were participating in the study. Um, in training, we had um, the online training that they completed and then five practice sessions where they, were, where they completed a reflection of their use of the strategy and also had the opportunity to ask questions to the researcher. And then in maintenance, they had um, each participant had between two and five sessions which were conducted every two weeks. And that was just based on some of them, you know, could not continue in the study after the two sessions. All right, so the training materials, um, I really tried to emphasize an interactive nature in the training. I wanted participants to uh, feel engaged and not to just be <coughs> passively viewing materials. And so I did that through providing a lot of video examples, having questions and scenarios that they had to respond to and using reflections of strategy implementation, uh, both within the training itself and also um, in the, the practice sessions that they had. The training was housed on uh, D2L, so I could see if parents had accessed each um, part of the training, and they also responded to questions within the training, so I could give them feedback and they could receive that feedback. So we just used a community, which was kind of a cool way to do that. 
All right, so the content that I used for this particular training project um, uses the mnemonic POWER. And POWER stands for prepare the activity in AAC, offer opportunities for communication, wait for the child's communication, and respond to the child's communication. So I'll just detail kind of what I taught in each of these areas. But basically, when thinking about preparing the activity and the AAC for the child, I emphasize to parents that you want to pick something that's going to be really highly motivating to the child, um, that's also developmentally appropriate, so things that would be normally available to a child of their age. Um, we wanted something that would allow lots of communication opportunities. There are plenty of activities that are highly motivating. It might be developmentally appropriate for a child with autism, but wouldn't necessarily encourage them to communicate at all. Um, and then when, when they had available to provide a formal AAC system, but I also deal, detailed to them the different types of less formal communication that they could use that's also kind of within AAC. So gestures, providing them choices with objects, those kinds of things as well. Um, so secondly, um, we taught them to provide opportunities for communication. This is my primary dependent variable that we're looking at within the study, but it's also paired with weight for the child's communication, and I'll explain how that kind of works in a second. Um, we encourage them to provide lots of choices to the child um, during the activity to help them direct the activity, to ask them questions, and to comment about what they were doing within the activity. So different, I think, from some research projects, we didn't provide any um, instances of sabotage, like if the parents wanted to do that, they could, but I wanted to be very naturalistic in that what is what would you normally do if you were just talking to a kid who didn't have a developmental delay or autism? Um, and so these are the things that we selected to try to use. Um, next, we encourage the parent to wait for the child's communication after they've provided an opportunity. So if they asked a question, to wait at least five seconds for their child to respond. Um, a lot of times, especially for dyad B and C, the child will respond before five seconds. But for child A, that five seconds of wait time is really crucial. And so just thinking about, you know, that sometimes children need time to process. And we, it, we explained why wait time is so important, especially for this population. And that helps also to get away from the dominating of the interaction, where the, if they know they have to sit there and wait, that would be really helpful. Um, this was a part that parents said was difficult for them, and so I have some ideas in the future that I'd like to talk about at the end of how we can even support them further with wait time. And then finally, um, every time the child communicated, even if it was difficult to understand what they were trying to communicate, we asked the parents to respond. So even if they need to ask for clarification, so, oh, I, I know you just told me something, but I'm not sure what you said. Can you tell me again or whatever, just so that the child is getting that feedback every time they're communicating. Um, and they feel like their communication is valued. All right, so the, mo the online training was broken into six different modules. I did that because I wanted parents to be able to access it even if they only had small snippets of time, so they didn't feel like they had to sit down for a two-hour block or whatever and do the training. Some parents completed everything in one shot. Others went and did a couple of modules and then would come back you know, later that day or another day to complete more. Um, I don't know that there's a best way to go about it, but I wanted it to be flexible flexible for parents because I know, you know, I have three children and sometimes I only get a 10 minute window where I can do something different before I'm interrupted. Um, and I imagine that it's even more challenging sometimes for parents of children with disabilities. So basically the first module did an overview of the strategy and then the second, third, and fourth, second, third, fourth, and fifth modules broke down each aspect of that strategy, each of the steps and provided you know, a lot of um, examples and instructional activities around that. And then the last module did a summary where it pulled everything together and they created a plan for how they would play with their child using this strategy. And then we had um, five different play sessions where we went into the home just like we did in baseline, but we allowed them to try to implement the strategy. We gave them a prompt just, you know, implement the power strategy. And then they played like they would play with their child using that strategy and did a reflection at the end where they could indicate how well they felt they did in implementing each one of those steps. Um, and then we offered them the opportunity to ask questions to the instructor. Um, a lot of the parents didn't take that opportunity maybe in one or two sessions. And it wasn't even like they took it necessarily in the beginning, like maybe the first or second session where they're practicing. Um, some of them wouldn't start asking questions until they tried the strategy for a few sessions. And others would just kind of comment about what they had done, not necessarily ask a question. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I'd previously done um, a project like this with paraeducators, and we only had one practice session. 
and none of them would ask questions. So this time I was like, well, let's do more sessions, see if they do have questions. Maybe it's just intimidating. You try something the first time, it's like, no, did I do it right? So I think um, that was beneficial, but I'm still trying to think of ways to help parents maybe feel more comfortable asking questions or even understand what questions they need, or maybe the reflection is sufficient. They kind of know where they stand and they don't have questions after that. How many sessions for those? How many play sessions? I know you said I just five. five. So they were about 10 to 15 minutes, but generally they were about 12 minutes. The kids did not have. <laughs> oh, 60 is the total? The total. Across them. Yes. So we did not videotape them for each session for 60 minutes. No. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> that would be a really long session. Yeah, each of our sessions, and in the beginning, too, all of the sessions were standardized to 10 minutes segments. We usually were in the home for, you know, a 30-minute window with about 15 minutes where we were actually collecting data. Sorry, thanks for asking that. All right, so um, we conducted, of course, procedural and inter-rater in, inter reliability for this project. So the online training, like I mentioned before, we used a course management system that helped me to understand, you know, the procedural uh, reliability of parents actually completing and getting access to that training. Uh, for data collection, we used a checklist to make sure that we followed the proper procedures, and the, that ranged from 99 to 100%. I think one of the sessions, we forgot to ask them if they had questions, so that was the thing that was missed in one of those sessions. Uh, for coding reliability, um, we had a mean of 93% for communication opportunities with a range of 83 to 98, and then you can see also um, communication turns and responses, that was a mean of 97%, and our ranges uh, were around 90 to 92 and up to 100%. I thought this was a little bit interesting. I anticipated that the children would be a little bit harder <laughs> to code, but the communication opportunities, the way that we, um, the way that we behaviorally defined that was they had to ask a question, provide a comment or a choice to the child, and then they had to wait five seconds. And if they, did, if they didn't wait five seconds, the child could maybe respond before that five seconds was up. So if the child responded within that five second window, then that could be counted as a communication opportunity. But if they started talking again, then the clock kind of reset. Um, so they had to have that wait time. So that's the part that I think got a little bit tricky with coding um, and why I think you see just a little bit lower coding um, scores there. Right. So here's the results of the data. This is a little bit difficult. Um, to see in some ways because we're using the same scale for all of them, but Dyad A really has much lower communication skills. So you can see mom's communication um, or her, the opportunity she provides is, you know, about half of what is being provided with Dyad B and even less than that for Dyad C. So there's definitely something going on as far as how often parents are providing opportunities based on their child's initial communication levels. Um, and it's difficult for you to see kind of the dynamic of how um, the child changed in diet A, but basically they're not doing much, maybe one or two at max in baseline of communication or communication turns. So he's really not communicating much at all. So Sarah, can you just take us through that? What sure. those lines mean? I'm yes, not, I'm, I'm sorry. not picking it up. Okay, so um, at the top line we have the parent <laughs> opportunities. That's the darkest line that we have. And that will generally be the highest points that you see in each of them. So um, you can see on, the, on dyad A, we have um, everything is above the child at the bottom. Um, the parent responses and child communications are generally tend to be very close to each other. So they're actually on top of each other primarily. I think except for one session, there's like one difference or something. They didn't respond to one of the communication terms for the child. Um, and so if you look at the other sessions, so we have um, in Dyad B, you'll see that the child's communication is kind of in the middle of the parent opportunities and responses. So the parent's not responding quite as many times as the child is communicating. Um, but they are um, responding, and then you can see later that um, the parent responses, yes, sorry, the parent responses are again mirroring. Um, like if you look at Dyad B in the maintenance here, you can see that the child is actually surpassing the parent's opportunities, which is great because that means the child's now initiating communication, but you can still see that those responses then are sort of mirroring what the child is doing. Does that make sense? So there's a pretty clear indication that parents are sort of following the pattern of the child's communication. But every once in a while we get a, a moment where things are just a bit lower. And I, I've tried to analyze exactly what happened at those particular sessions. And 
You know, I think this is sort of what happens sometimes with kids with autism. Like some of the sessions, the kids just weren't motivated. They could be doing an activity that was exactly the same as an activity the last session that they were crazy about. And this time they're just like, me, it's not that cool. Why are we doing this? And parents would try to like mix it up. But sometimes in some sessions, the kids just not as interested. So we do see some overlap, but there's definitely an increase in what the parents are doing and a definite increase, um, especially for diet B in the child's communication when compared to baseline. So just a couple questions on this. So yeah, the, the frequency of behaviors, this is the, just the overall number yes. of the times you're doing this is in a 10 minute sample? In a 10 minute sample. And they were all standardized. So we took the first minute off and it's the so next 10 minutes. Up, and even in baseline, they're doing a lot. Yeah. They're doing more than like, they're doing more than like one every like 20 seconds. Is that correct? Am I reading that? Because I mean, that would be. So, so the, the child here. 25, 10 minutes. You mean? So they're doing yeah. like two and a half. But I'm saying the parents though, like oh. the bottom parents doing like yeah. more than one mm -hmm. every, so wait, six. Okay. 10 seconds, 15 seconds. So this parent's providing about <laughs> six opportunities per minute. But if they have a five second response, that means like they're like, boom, they're like rapid fire. Mm -hmm. Doing that during baseline. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so they, I mean, so these, some of these parents are starting out with like some pretty strong behaviors, but you can see still, even after training, they're making growth and the children are learning. So, so what I think is so interesting about, especially looking at diet A, and I'm sorry that the, you know, the scale doesn't really work for kids with such great oh, yeah, it's variability, but that's kind of the way that the single subject is expected to be presented. So um, here we can see, you know, there's like really not much going on, but, oh, and she starts to make changes, some, not completely drastically, but he's not giving her any feedback really. So it's very hard to be motivated to continue. And over time, he, he slowly starts to kind of match her a little bit more. I think that's really exciting. It's not, I mean, his, his data doesn't look as exciting on the graph, but when we look later at um, overlap, it is pretty exciting to kind of see, you know, that he was able to make growth even starting like from basically a zero. And then one other question in terms of your child communication, are you including all sorts of communication, gesture, pointing, yeah. verbalization? So, so we had a lot of rules about that. So we did not, conf we did not include um, less formal means of communication unless it made sense to the opportunity the parent provided. So for example, if they just grabbed a toy, we're not counting that unless the parent had said, what toy would you like to play with? Or something that made, that made sense. If they, because otherwise it's hard for us to figure out, is this play? Is this communication? And such. So we had specific rules based on each type of communication style that they were using. So we had rules for gestures. We had rules for pointing. We did not use any facial expressions, although the kids definitely used facial expressions because that's a lot more difficult to measure. Um, and then, of course, um, verbal communication. And one of the ways that we sort of um, helped with the coding is we actually transcribed all of the sessions before we ever coded them. Um, that ended up not being as beneficial as we thought. We thought that would really help if someone was like, I don't know what they're saying. It's already transcribed. They could go back. Turned out that my coders were better at figuring out what the kids were saying than my transcribers. <laughs> so they were like, well, I know what they said, but it's not on there. So every time they would go to check, like they weren't sure what sub, it would just said unintelligible, which is what they were supposed to do if they couldn't figure it out. Um, so that's something I probably will skip next time because it took a lot of time to do that. Other Sorry, one, one other it's question. Okay, yeah. um, in terms of parent opportunities, I'm, I'm just, what I'm, what I'm interested in is that baseline being as high as it is. So mm -hmm. trying to figure out in terms of like how, what exactly a parent opportunity would, would commenting on the child's play yes. also be? Counted? As long as they waited five seconds after or the child responded to that. Okay. So what might be happening, because I'm just trying to figure out exactly what's happening behaviorally mm -hmm. over time with the parents. So if the child's playing, so, so an opportunity does not require that the child actually doesn't have the materials. So the parent can give an opportunity even if the child is playing with the materials. So for example, if the child's playing with a toy and the parent says, um, you have a ball that would, mm -hmm. and, and wait between that, uh -huh. that, would, that would still count as an opportunity. Yes. Okay. What I, what so we, that is not as surprising to me. I yeah. was like, wow, that parent is doing a lot of yeah. withholding. And I think that's, well, and I think that's why you see, you know, not necessarily the child responding every time. Because there's a lot of times, especially, this happens actually throughout, where they might provide an opportunity that the child is not going to respond to. Right. Um, where they're just saying something about what they're doing and the child is like, okay, yeah. like that. But it is a chance if they wait long enough 
for the child to interject if they want to. And so we're trying, I didn't want to negate having um, comments altogether because it is a way for a child to learn that they can initiate um, versus if we all only use questions or choices, then all the child learns is that they're passive recipient and they can only communicate if there's this type of opportunity provided. So. Do you notice a change in that? Like, I do have that data, more. but to be honest, I haven't analyzed specifically. It, at first glance, it didn't look like there was much going on as far as how that was changed. We also actually gathered data also about modeling, and if the parent was modeling, we did not teach that in here, but I kind of wanted to see, like, are they naturally doing that, modeling different forms, like, so are they signing for the child? Are they giving examples of how you would use AAC? And a couple of the parents did it a few times, but it was pretty uncommon. And that definitely happened way more after training. Like it happened never in baseline. It happened way more after training, but that's because in some of the videos, people are modeling, but I never taught them that particular skill. So that's kind of fun. And, and but so, it wasn't very frequent. So you could actually have an increase in the parents' behavior with them actually talking less by your definitions, which is because one of the things I found when we work with parents is some, you know, you have some parents that really aren't doing much, mm -hmm. but they also have parents that are just literally talking at their child nonstop and yes. they're not giving them opportunities in between. So you could actually, the yes. way you're defining it, that, that <laughs> increase could actually be a reduction in parent talking. <laughs> yes. And actually, when we collected data and analyzed it, we did include like the full length of time the parent was communicating and instances where they communicated but didn't provide enough wait time. And so we could go back and analyze the full length of time that they were talking and see if that was different before and after. I would say for a, a dyad like A, she's probably doing more communicating, like mm -hmm. taking up more space because she really, a lot of the time she's just sitting there silent. Mm -hmm. um, for dyad B and C, I'd be surprised. I mean, I, I would think that they probably actually backed off because they're giving more space after saying something and not just mm -hmm. talking and talking <coughs> and talking. Sarah, yeah. Sarah, did you distinguish at all between the kind of communication? So, for example, uh, the kind of communication from the parent that requests a response mm -hmm. versus a, just a, a statement that might or might not be commented on. So, that there was, did you try to make any distinctions there? So, thinking about like, is it a comment? Is it a question? Is yes. it a choice? Yes, we did that in our data analysis, but I have not like looked at all of that yet. Good questions. <clears throat> of course, it made it more tedious as well for those who are analyzing data. But this is sort of a more general question. Do you find like in um, these interventions, given like that there might be, you know, the uh, autism phenotype among family members, and these are like the, the mom of the child that has autism? Mm -hmm. um, do you find that the efficacy of the intervention sort of depends upon the level of, especially since these are communication interventions, mm -hmm. and that's a, such a pervasive part of, you know, the disorder, um, that mom's or dad's level of symptomatology um, sort of impacts or moderates the effectiveness of the intervention? Um, I would say with this particular group, I don't, I don't believe that any of the parents that were participating were on the autism spectrum. Um, I do think with Dyad A, mom is a second language learner. She was definitely fluent in English, but I think that affected her ability to maybe gain as much knowledge as she could in this particular intervention. And I also think there were maybe some cultural things that were different in their interactions that were, did, were not taken into account in the particular intervention. Um, I, don't, I don't know exactly what I could do, and I tried to probe her like, what would you like done differently? And the only thing she would really say is, I want more videos that are like my son. Because a lot of the videos had kids who communicated much more than her son. Because her son's really not communicating much at all. Um, and so that's something that I plan to add in future interventions. You know, a wider variety of different types of communication. Or maybe even somehow tailor it to kind of the initial level of their child. Like maybe they could describe their child and then it handpicks kind of, you know, videos that are more like their child might be. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think in other interventions that could be the case. One thing I have done when, or other projects that could be more of an issue. One thing I did do in this particular project with a, a slightly different group that I was looking at is I did not include any parents that had a suspected disability. So I did actually have one family where dad wanted to participate. Um, his case manager for the child was, you know, like really interested in me helping teach him different things. 
And when I went and met with them, it was very clear that he also had a developmental disability. And so I didn't feel like it was going to be as beneficial for, like, I didn't think he would be able to get as much out of the study. And then, of course, it's another confound. To, yeah. do, do you have a threshold for cognitive ability to, to work in this system? Or is it all levels of cognitive? Oh, for the child or? The child. I have had a huge variety of at least communication ability, which I think sometimes does speak to cognitive ability. When I did things with paraeducators, I had children who were very much like dyad A, who communicated very little. Sometimes it was more due to motor function, so maybe their cognitive ability was higher. Um, to me, it's a little bit difficult to assess, you know, even where the cognitive abilities are for some of these kids because if they can't communicate, there's not great tools out there to really understand where they're at. Um, but then I would say with probably dyad B and C that their cognitive ability is at least within normal range. I know dyad B after the intervention, they went and got a more formal autism diagnosis and they were suggesting a very high number of behavioral intervention hours in part because of his IQ level. Um, and so they said, you know, he needs this much because he's not reading, reaching his potential at all. Um, communication wise so I don't I'd never really heard of that before but I was like that's exciting you should take every hour they give you <laughs> so other questions are they all using a variety of men's communication either devices or pets or so across each diet it was kind of a so this is the part that frustrates me so much about these projects I always recruit children who are using those systems uh -huh. and they just rarely seem to use them at home and so I would say that out of all of these children in this particular project, none of them used a formal AAC system in any of the sessions. Some of them did sign. Some of them, all of them used gestures. Uh, many of them were using like objects within the play environment that the parent would provide choices and they would select. So they're using less formal means of AAC, still AAC, but not what you think of when you think about the systems a kid might use, like an iPad or something like that. None of them had something that formal. Did you code that it meant to like yes. realities? Yeah. And if they were using more than one, we coded that as well. So if they were using <laughs> speech plus a gesture, we coded both. Yeah. That'd be interesting. Yeah. I'm sure you're planning to look at yes. at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Getting uh, reliability for that data is much more challenging. Yeah. So we kind of just went for the bare bones first to figure out what, what we found. So. All right, um, in addition to, of course, looking you know, visually at the data that we have, we also completed an effect size measure, non-overlap of all pairs. And I know many people are not necessarily familiar with this if they don't do single subject, subject research. So I first listed the different um, types uh, or the different strengths of the effect size so that's different from other effect size measures. So strong would be you know, 1 to 0.93, and then medium is in the other range week is under um, 0.65. So if we look at the communication opportunities, all the parents were actually in the medium range. When we look at dyad A, we also look at their uh, maintenance data. So this is just the training period that we're looking at. In parentheses, it's when I added maintenance as well. Because um, some of the parents just, or, and the children seem to take a little bit longer to kind of digest the training. Um, so all of them had medium effect sizes with dyad A looking large if you look at the whole, everything after um, baseline. Uh, for child communication, uh, dyad B actually had the strongest intervention effects, um, which is not surprising when you look at the data. Dyad A had medium effects, but you can see that they strengthened a lot once we're looking at that maintenance data. So it took a while for him to kind of change. Um, his behaviors based on the new requirements that he was having from his mom. And dyad C kind of remained about the same. Again, we were looking just at communication opportunities as far as making decisions about when to um, start different phases of the study and when to start other people in training. And, and then what, responses. What are, these what are they? Hmm? What are these measures? Units, um, standard deviation units, what are the measures? This is, this is an effect size measure. Is that what you mean? So standard deviation units? Yes, I believe so. I think so. So those are very strange. That's a great question. It's actually not standard. It's not standard deviation. Mm -hmm. It's, it's um, um, yeah, distribution three. I don't remember. Non-parameter. Yeah. Um, yeah, get into the effects. It doesn't really relate to traditional. Like, yeah, it doesn't. Um, I can give you. It's more, it's more of a non-parametric measure. Yeah. Yeah. 
as a non-overlapping data. It, it doesn't involve a standard deviation. It's not an effect size D at all. It's basically trying to give some kind of measure of how effective was it based on how many times it's overlapping from baseline to other phases of the this, of this study. So if there's a lot of overlap, that suggests that they're kind of still performing similar to baseline. When, when there's less, of, less overlap, then that's suggesting that they've made more changes. Would one mean sense? there's no overlap at all? Yes, correct. Zero would mean it's, it's all overlap, all. yes. <clears throat> yes. And so we look at responses. I thought this was the most interesting part of the study. We weren't really targeting parents to just become more responsive, but that seems to be where most change was made. So all the parents had strong intervention effects for responding, which is great because that is the method in which their child will recognize, oh, they value that I'm communicating and will then in turn hopefully communicate more frequently. So maybe I should start using that as my primary to kind of vary. Yeah. Okay. So the parent responses was based on every time the child communicated and had a communication turn, did they or did they not respond to that? So in part, this is dependent upon the child's communication as well. And so as the child's communication goes up, there's obviously more opportunity for them to be responsive. So I think that's in part why we're seeing more because the children's communication is going up. So their responsiveness can go up more easily. I was wondering if you looked at that, that exactly yeah. in terms of percentage. Like, so did the child's percent of responsiveness to the parents? The, the percentages were more similar than just looking at the, the numbers themselves. Yeah. Yep. Other questions? Would you guys like to see some videos? Okay, so this is Dyad B first. He communicates a lot more frequently. We'll see first a clip in baseline and then a clip um, after they've been in training. And hopefully it's loud enough or that I don't blast you. Good job. What is that? Yeah. Is it a beer? Beer. What does the bear say? Monkey. It's a monkey. That's a monkey. Oh, good job. What? What does that look like? You help? Yeah. You help? Okay, good job. Okay, step down. What is that? Elephant. What color is the elephant? Purple. Purple. You found that elephant? Good job. Are you going to find all of them? You're going to find all the bears? Yeah. Cookie. Cookie. Yeah. I cookie. Good I job. Good job. No, I cookie. Mm-hmm. Do you like to eat cookies? Yes. Yes. Uh, Present. Present. Are you putting it on top of it? What is this? Balloon, yeah. Okay, so let's just take a second to kind of think about the differences between the two. And this is pretty representative of sort of what happened with this diet, which is why I picked these particular clips. One thing that I always think about, and this isn't necessarily related to the training, but mom just seems a little bit hesitant in the first clips. Like she doesn't really know what to do and she wants to engage with him, but maybe doesn't know how. And in the second clips, I feel like she's much more empowered, animated. I don't know, there's something different about like how she kind of holds herself. So I think she feels like she has information. She kind of has a general sense of like what to do. What were some of your impressions of the difference between the two? Childhood more verbal is second. Yeah. More clear. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's fully based on like his abilities. I think in the first activity, it was something he could do pretty independently. And he, I guess he could have also maybe done this independently, but I think mom set it up in a way that sort of required that he engage with her a little bit more frequently. So she could have done that maybe with the puzzle as well. Maybe she could have just had him with a couple of pieces and he could have requested pieces with her. But I think that's one difference that you see here. 
it's not in the but uh, I can sense that it has more to do. Mm -hmm. Even the mom may be saying some of similar talks, but then he would be saying more things. He would reach out for another pair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he initiates more. I know mom, especially this particular mom, was very much at a loss as how she could interact with her child. Um, she knew things that he liked, but she didn't know how to like kind of insert herself into those activities. So he loved puzzles, but she didn't know how to <coughs> kind of engage with him in those activities. So she mentioned from this intervention just um, during sessions that she just could think of better ways and better activities to sort of engage him and when they had success with certain activities she decided to use those again like one of the things that they really love to do after doing this intervention in the in the sessions we had play activities and then we also did one generalization session which i haven't mentioned during each phase and that was just parents picking art or music which is really play as well but it forced them to sort of think outside of the box of okay if i was going to sort of get out of just providing a toy what would i do this particular mom realized that her son loves to paint and so she used that for her generalization activities and at one point they were actually painting on a birdhouse and he decided that he wanted to paint the whole alphabet on that house and she was kind of like like this is going to take forever but he was not going to let go he was like no we're doing this and it was very, like a very interactive session i almost thought about showing that but i was like it's almost like not representative of exactly what he did in every session because he was just like this is my this is my thing um but I think that's interesting, you know, they, she definitely was thinking more about how can I pick an activity that he really enjoys, but also that it lends itself to me being more involved with him. So that's kind of that first step of the strategy. Other things you noticed? So she's definitely more clearly expanding his, or, or actually imitating back what he says mm -hmm. in terms of responding to his, his response. Yeah. Yeah, I think in the first one, there was a point, I think, where he actually said something that she didn't even acknowledge. Um, but here, she's really, and even when, I love at the beginning where he says elephant, but who would know, right? Like, it's, I think in context, because there's that picture there, you know, you can kind of figure it out. But she's like, what did you say? And she really tries to understand that. And I don't really think she was doing much of that before. Only when it was like very, you know, like he was being very adamant about something, which she tried to kind of figure out what he was trying to say. Okay, here's the next dyad. This one is a lot harder to see differences in some ways um, because there's just not as much communication from the child, but you can see how the mom kind of changes what she does. And this first, oops, I'm sorry. This first session is very typical of what they did in baseline. So you'll see the baseline here. Sorry, I realized now I could have made this part a little shorter. <laughs> Okay, what do you think about the differences between these two? So what was happening in baseline with 
nearly every session is there were no toys, even though I had told them, you know, play as you would normally play. I, I, you know, that's probably what they were doing before. Um, to her, playing was just like hugging and, you know, touching her child. And some of it involved, you know, asking questions like, where's your nose? Kind of quizzing questions, which sometimes you seemed to be interested in and other times kind of annoyed by. Um, after training, she started bringing toys into the mix, things that he was motivated by, um, and tried to, even though he was sometimes sort of wanting to do them independently, she was still trying to insert herself into that activity. I think one thing that she does that I did, that definitely did not teach in training, but I think it's sort of positive, is he does do a lot of sound effects, and then she kind of mirrors those back, and I think that's a really positive thing, because if you think about development generally, like he's still, you know, at a very pre-linguistic phase, for a lot of his communication. And she's kind of doing things that you would do, you know, with a young baby um, who's kind of doing those things as well. So I think that's a positive thing, even though that's not necessarily something that I taught. I mean, I guess it could kind of go in responding, but um, I thought that was positive as well. I also liked that, I mean, she, you can see in here, she provided choices. Like he didn't necessarily like indicate his choice very well, or he did, I guess he took both of them. <laughs> he sort of like said like, I want, but then he kept, kept both of them. Um, and she did, she did some commenting. Um, so I think she's kind of trying to use a variety of different methods, whereas before, you know, she's kind of just sticking to the, give me a hug and kind of questioning and sort of requesting things. Other thoughts? She's exposed to both languages in the home? That's, that's a really, that's a great question. So um, at home, mom did speak Arabic to the whole family, but she stopped speaking it to him because she felt he didn't understand it. So she only was speaking in English to him. And so he's definitely hearing Arabic, um, but she did not feel like he was responding to Arabic, that he was understanding English better. So she kind of stopped using that. And I asked her, you know, like before we started the sessions, you know, will you, are you, do you use Arabic with him? Cause I need to, we need to be able to code that. Like I'll have to find someone who can code those particular sessions. And she's like, we really don't. Um, so that made it a little bit difficult when she's doing sound effects sometimes to be like, if she's speaking in Arabic, but she really didn't end up doing that. So, yeah. And I think that, you know, that's somewhat unfortunate because I think it could have been beneficial to maybe have both inputs for him. Um, and they, this is a family who is not here permanently. I think she hopes to be here permanently because she can't really see going back to her home country with his diagnosis. He was actually diagnosed here. Um, and she thought initially the challenges that he was having was based on moving because um, he was pretty young when they moved um, and started like his regression around that time. So, yeah. Yeah. It's so, interesting to have any sort of feasibility you know, from her, which it sounds like you tried to get a bit of. Yeah, yeah she wasn't. So I can actually share that a little bit. So here's the social validity that I collected from the parents. I had several different ways. So one, you know, I looked at their um, reflections to see how they felt that they were mastering the strategy as one way to kind of determine like what changes I need to make to the strategy. So if I recognize that none of them feel very confident in one of the areas and clearly I need to do a better job teaching that. Um, and then we also collected a training evaluation at the end um, as one measure of social validity. Certainly there's many others we could have done, but that's what we chose to do for this particular study. Um, all the parents said they were satisfied with the training and they would recommend it to other parents. Many of them said that they felt like their child was communicating better, that they were, they learned things that they, that was helping them to interact more effectively with their child. A lot of the parents mentioned that wait time was especially helpful, even though it was the hardest thing for them to do. Um, and the one parent from Dyad A that we just saw in the video is the one who kind of said, you know, I just want, the only thing I would change is I want more video models that are like my son. And I think that's, you know, that's an important thing that needs to be added to the training as well. Because it's hard for a parent to feel like they're on the right track when all the video models that they're seeing are kids who are communicating at a much higher level. So, so you mentioned that you were interested, you, you were surprised, or, or you were hoping to target families where there was a formal AAC system in yes. place, but then they didn't use it, which, yes, mm -hmm. yes, that's exactly right. Um, yeah. But then my, my question is, were the video examples then with the AAC, with formal AAC systems? Mm -hmm. So the parents were seeing video examples with formal AAC systems, but then they were choosing not to do that. Like there was actually a lot of different types of systems. So I think in the, I'm trying to remember back of every single video model I use. I think there's only one um, like communication system that's a voice output, and others are things like picture symbols or use of objects or gestures. So there's definitely kids that are communicating 
similar to how these kids are communicating. Um, I would actually say that a lot of the video examples, the kids are communicating less frequently than dyad B and C. Um, but they're, they're definitely using a wide variety of systems and many of them are not formal. So, okay, so they were seeing, and there, oh, there's also formal. sign. Okay, as so they're seeing examples of not formal. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering if they were seeing examples of formal, like why would they choose it not to use formal, but there were other examples in there as well. Mm -hmm. And I think some of it, like some of these parents just didn't really have formal means uh, available to them at all. Some of these kids did not have, and I, it makes sense kind of for diet B and C. Like I don't know that those children really are going to require a, a voice output system, for example. But having means like, you know, learning how to recognize their gestures or having signs for some things to help them clarify makes a lot of sense in those cases. For diet A, I mean, the fact that they're only using picture symbols at school to me is like a little bit frustrating because it's quite limited. Into, and all he's really doing at school is requesting. And I know that he's got a pretty low level of communication currently, but part of that could be he doesn't really have access to a system that gives him the ability to communicate in the ways that all of us can communicate. That's one of the things I was wondering about, which is one of the reasons I think parents don't typically use AAC systems at home is they don't get formal training in how to actually use the system. Mm -hmm. And there's differences between PEC, sign, voice output. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm wondering, um, I mean, I, I, I agree, like, in, in terms of looking at the, the video example of child B, I don't think that an AAC formal system would be something that would necessarily be um, yeah. a choice for the family. But for, for kids, I'm wondering, like, to what extent you can include more formalized training in a particular AAC system. Because I would guess that would be where, you know, I can see parents just going to gestures because it's, like, that's easier. I've been doing it since my child was a baby, mm -hmm. and learning PECs is pretty complicated, for mm -hmm. example, or sign language, you have to actually have the, the knowledge of what the signs are. Yep. So I was wondering if you thought more about sort of yeah, so doing detailed training on the one, specific. Um, I don't want to be involved in that training personally. And there's a number of reasons for that. I feel like this particular training would sort of take place after a formal system is in place. So what I would hope for this, these types of training in the future is to have um, a collaboration with maybe speech language pathologists who are doing augmentative and alternative communication um, assessments. And once the parent has that system, they've been trained from whatever provider yeah. they're using. Good luck. But that's the thing, like no one person yeah. can be an expert in every type of system. Right. Yeah. And really it's up to, it's the, it doesn't really fall under the purview of say special education, which is where my training is. Right. A special educator would not provide specific training on a device. That would be the speech language pathologist yeah. or the assistive technology coordinator or even the company would come out and provide a training. Um, and so I, I want to pair with companies in the future to do that. And I have made some contacts where, you know, I, I might be able to do that, but it's challenging and it really limits my pool of people that I can do research with as well, because that's such a small population. So at this point, I've kind of done something a little bit more broad and hope to narrow to that. Sure. So one of the things that thinking along those lines, because I mean, I, I completely agree with you, and this is where I, I think one of the reasons we don't see more uptake, especially in young, among young kids where we don't know if they're going to end up being able to communicate in other ways, is um, that um, some of these more general, just general communication trainings seem mm -hmm. to be much more socially valid and so much more acceptable to parents. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the reasons when schools automatically put kids on AAC systems without actually talking to the parents about mm -hmm. what they're actually going to do at home, I actually think that it's counterproductive for communication yeah. training. Yeah. Okay. Questions or comments? I'm to the question side. Um, yes. I wondered one of the, the graph that you showed on uh -huh. the um, and then the page, mm -hmm. uh, the number of Dropped a lot. Yeah, the so very last point. So, uh, what would be some of the information about the challenges? You know, th that particular child had a lot of behavioral challenges, and that was a day where there were more behavioral challenges than others. And you can kind of see that also here. Um, he was a little bit more steady in the behavioral challenges that he was <laughs> engaging in during baseline. I. I mean, I could have, I guess I could have continued to collect data for a longer period of time to see if it went back up. Um, I, I don't know. He's a, he's a bit of a puzzle. 
you know, sometimes the kids are really on board and other times they're not, but you can also see for whatever reason, mom's communication dropped. And I don't know if we get to a certain point where they need to, to have a booster to remember what they're supposed to do. I don't know. But there's all, there all seems to be, in this kind of research, a drop-off at some point, which is why I go a full 10 weeks to kind of see, like, where is that starting to occur? And for diet B, you can see that it does really start to happen after, you know, the third, uh, third session for the parent. And so, because I always um, have a question in my mind for infections, how they generalize all these skills mm -hmm. for both the child and the parent. And I saw you put the gene. Yep, those are the generalization sessions. How do you... How do you define it? Mm -hmm. like, how do you define it? So I just told the parents during certain activities when we would go collect data, you know, I would tell the people going to collect the data, have them do a play session, this particular session, and then we would tell them, okay, at this particular session, we want you to do an art or a music activity. Now, to me, they seem very similar. Like, it's still all part of play in my mind, but to parents, for some of them, that was kind of a stretch. Like, what would I do if we did an art project? I don't even know what they like to do with art. So it did sort of stretch them, and there weren't as there weren't really video models for any art projects except for maybe Play-Doh, which I think kind of borders like both, right? Is it art? Is it play? Is it is it both? It is okay. Um, and then we didn't have any examples of music, in video examples, but we did have scenarios where we tried to get them to think about, you know, if you were singing this song with your child and they signed pig, what would you do in that situation? Um, so we tried to sort of build that into training, but we didn't. We intentionally didn't do it as much because we sort of still wanted to see, you know, are they able to generalize without much support in that area? Yeah, so if you look at each of the Gs, you can kind of see like how that changed over time for them. Um, so. And the last diet actually did not have a generalization session in maintenance. Uh, different topic, but one thing I'm thinking about is um, how the context seems to really uh, matter in terms of what communication opportunities and things that. So would it make sense um, to have different groups, maybe a group where everybody does the same activity pre and post so you can tease apart how much you do with the context? So just yeah, I think that could be communication differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that could be a great thing. I think in this particular project, I didn't go that route because I wanted it to be very naturalistic, like what actually happens in these parents' homes? Right. What would happen if I implemented that? But I do think trying to tease out, like, how much does the activity that they pick really influence the child's? And I think for the groups of kids with autism, like, compared to other groups that I've worked with, it makes a way bigger difference. There, you know, there's a lot more up and down. And, and again, you could really literally provide the same activity, and one day they're, like, on board with that activity, and another day they're not. So... I don't know, because I mean, if you only say like you only had cars available or something, and the kid's not into cars that day, to me, I'd have a hard time being like, okay, well, that's fine. Like, we'll just collect. I would want maybe to still give the parent the choice of a couple of different activities that they could pull from. I'm just thinking uh, that in diet B, that first activity, yeah. you know, I don't even know how you would communicate better in that situation with what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So it seems that. And that's why them. part of the um, strategy really was teaching them, like, Thinking about what you're going to do with them is sort of an important part before you're actually in that moment communicating with them. So, well, we, what we started to do because we had the same issue with toys. Um, when we would do our generalization measures at the home, we would we, we just would let the parents use their own toys, and that was hugely problematic because they would change toys between pre and post. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in, in one situation, they would have stuff that we could potentially elicit some like play, but other mm -hmm. ones that didn't. So we started sending in. A standard set of toys that parents could augment with their own toys but at least then we knew all of the toy items that we would need to get a wide range of different yeah. skill sets were available mm -hmm. and that actually has helped I mean it took me whatever I don't know nine years to figure this out but that actually helped a lot um, I mean I totally agree and, and then we allow them to supplement too so it's not like yeah. they have to be toys that they don't yeah and I think that makes a lot of sense I was a little bit nervous when I was starting the projects with parents you know will these parents because it, I was working with a huge variety in socioeconomic status with these families. Would all of them have toys that actually worked for their kids? And that ended up being like not a non-issue. All of them had something in the house the kid was really into, regardless of like their their uh, economic status. Can I have a second question? Yeah. So, um, for coding, how do you handle that? Do who codes and do they code pre and post? Are they blind to what they're doing? 
Yeah, um, in this particular project, it was um, undergraduate research assistants and graduate research assistants. They don't know exactly, in this project, they did not know exactly what the codes meant for the project. Um, so they couldn't tell when they're happening, but because it's a single subject design, we have to code the first data before we code the rest of the data, because we have to make decisions along the way. So they're not, it's not like they're getting the last session first to code. I have to make those decisions as we go. So there could be, and I think that's true with any single subject design, there could be some concern about them kind of noticing more in the end. Um, but we did actually a lot more reliability than we had to, because I actually made them train to 90% reliability for every single dyad they coded, because they were so different that I didn't feel like we could just come to reliability on the coding system with one kid and that would work with any kid. So first they had to come to 90% um, reliability with them before we ever actually did reliability for other sessions as well. So, and those were definitely more random, like they didn't know when they were getting which one because I would provide them at different points in time. So some of that reliability was happening after all the data was collected. So that was a little bit more random. I wish that could happen more, but I can't figure out a way to make it happen in single subject while you need that data analyzed like right away, so. Please, 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 that they were kind of aware of the behavior. How did you maintain the blinding? What was the first thing you said? I'm sorry, in response to that question. I wasn't following. They didn't, so like for every video that they're watching, there's some kind of code, which tells sure. the dyad, it tells me the date it was collected. Well, yeah, yeah. Tell, they didn't know like what those different things, I guess they could have figured oh, it out, okay. maybe, right? They didn't was, know, no, yeah, they didn't know, yeah. I didn't give them that, that, that information. I'm sure they could have probably figured it out, but I, that was one way I tried to like, you know, I didn't tell them, okay, you're gonna do a baseline session. Yeah. Let me know what you find. Okay. Um, and to be honest, like none of them really understood single subject design at all. <laughs> so even if I told them that, they probably would have been like, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but that's definitely a challenge with this type of research. So is this the same person, the same teacher person? So I had um, two people coding each dyad. So that person stayed the same. Um, sometimes one would be reliability and sometimes one would be primary encoder. So that changed a little bit, but we know we were getting a certain level of reliability, so. Yeah. And then, um, do you find a difference in terms of the reliability? Like one of, or which one is lower than the other two? Is there any difference between baseline encoding versus training versus in terms of reliability? That's a great question. Um, I don't think so. Um, but I'd have to look back for sure to know. Um, yeah, I don't remember. I didn't look. I didn't look at that specifically. But I, I think I would have. That would have, something would have flagged into me if it was really obvious. Mm -hmm. from that. But I could look at that. I just wonder if the more responses would lead to a lower reliability person, or the other way around. Because I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And then if after the training they find it old. A lot more modality to well, it's certainly easier to get higher reliability if there's more opportunities provided because you can make more errors. And versus, like, if there's only like 10 opportunities provided, if you make one error, then we're at 90 percent already. Mm -hmm. So that definitely influences things some. But I would say, um, for this, the people who were actually doing the coding, they would all say, you know, certain dads are like, oh, can you give me more of them? Because they're really easy to code because there wouldn't be as much going on. <laughs> so they could just code in the moment, whereas other dyads, they would have to pause it and go back. And so some dyads would take them, you know, maybe 10 minutes to code the length of the video. And others would take them like 30 minutes or longer to code because they're doing a lot of back and forth. So I don't know if that kind of answers your question, but I'd have to look back at the other two them for sure. So one thing I'm just trying to like wrap my head around and sort of placing this in the context of other um, sort of communication interventions is one of the things you refer to this as sort of AAC mm -hmm. and, and then you, you give a very broad definition of what AAC involves. Mm -hmm. But do you see this really as an AAC intervention or do you see this as an early language communication learning intervention? Like what, what is the AAC piece? I mean, I know that you said in your training mm -hmm. you had examples of mm -hmm. AAC or formal systems, but then really, parents are choosing not to use them. I really see it as a communication partner. Training. Okay, okay, all right. And so that does fall under the broad category of AAC, but I definitely don't see myself being excluded from other 
um, interventions. I, but I also don't see myself specifically to just the group of autism. So this is the only project I've ever done where I only had children with autism in it. All the rest of my projects have included children with a wide variety of different communication challenges. So, so they were more likely using formal systems? <laughs> I wish. Oh, okay. Not because, I mean, it's, it's more the, the issue, like, the, the, I, mean, I, you know, it's like, I think I'm just trying to wrap my head around the AC, because when I hear AAC, mm -hmm. my first thought is you're talking about a formal system. And I know sign language can be kind of considered that, but you can also consider sign language just an alternative. I guess that's the alternative mm -hmm. form, but, but I mean, it's actually linguistic and symbolic. Well, I think anytime so, someone thinks of AAC, they think of like a computer. Yeah, or, or pads, an iPad, or, or whatever. Pad. Yeah, okay, yeah. Tag. Um, it's so much more broad than that in the field of AAC, and okay. so that's why. So you're you're coming from it from the field of AAC. Yeah, because it's just one of those things where you know it's yes. a terminology issue. But I'm and just I like think the other challenge is we do a horrible job providing systems to young children. We don't really give them any formal systems often until they're like in third grade, mm -hmm. <laughs> because you don't need to communicate till then. I, I don't I don't really know. Yeah. So it's 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 a challenge across the board when you're trying to work with young children who need these types of interventions or would benefit from them. Um, so it's not, I don't think it's ju just unique to what I'm doing specifically. Oh, no, no, yeah. I, no, I, I just, I'm sort of, because you know, the, the intervention itself and watching your intervention is very, very similar to, uh, I mean, we, A lot we, of all, we all come yeah. from the same sort of general mm -hmm. perspective, it's naturalistic language teaching. Yep. So I guess my question is sort of like, how does that fit in with AAC versus the broader sort of communication training? And again, like I yeah. don't see myself like training speci about specific AAC systems. Right, right, right. One because they change all the time. So that having an online training where that's provided would be sort of a nightmare yeah, to do, and it really would make more sense for the companies who provide those systems to provide those types of training because yeah. they're the experts in how you, you know, program them and all the, that those kind of details. Um, in another project where I worked with parents, I had one parent who had a child who used an iPad with Prolo Protocol. Oh, okay. And she said they had it, and they sometimes use it at home, but then she admitted later, like, they never really taught me how to use it. I don't know what I'm doing. So they never, ever, I mean, I knew at the beginning of the training, like, I knew at the beginning of the research project that they had this. So I was like, ooh, yay, how exciting. She'll start using it. They never used it in a single session. So you know what I want to know? Why is it that if, now that they're going over these apps, why doesn't the app have in-app training? I have no idea. Like, how cool would that be if a company could develop in-app training so the parent does... 15, 20, 30 minute training prior to actually unlocking. Yes. That's a great question. I believe because a lot of the, the background, the developers' background, are not in education. That's right. Yeah. So they don't know how to train. Although them. the developer's background for Prolog would go, because I happen to know him, is in education and they still didn't do that. I saw oh. that. I mean, I'm just thinking. And like, then he backed away from it. Yeah. So, like, he's not part of that anymore, but he was the original developer, but he worked with an app company. To help create it, yeah. And so um, then the assumption still, is whoever's using the app actually has that background. But yeah, originally, really like when it was a small thing that was happening, not so many people were getting it. He would go and do training, right? But you know, you can't maintain that yeah. method. So, yeah. Yeah, oh. other questions? Um, so just to clarify, the text is when the graph is weeks. It's sessions, not weeks. Mm -hmm. So that that it's occurred about week. weekly. No, I did about one, sometimes two sessions, depending on what phase of the study okay. the parents are in. So that means session one? It's, like, is, about, is usually week one. For everyone on this, it's week one. Okay. okay. And then occasionally I'd have a second session if we couldn't, say, do one session one week or something like that. That makes sense. So they have 